let's talk about this kind of retailer as media company phenomenon. Certainly something that Forrester has been writing about a couple, within the last couple of years. There's the Amazon thing, obviously, but we're also looking at companies like Target with Roundel um, with a lot of interest. So talk to me about why. You know, why is this happening, do you think? So the retailers have all been in the advertising business through shopper marketing for a very long time. And think about, you know, all of the vendors as we call them, all the products that we carry on our shelves. Um, obviously those same manufacturers also want to market those products so that they sell through Target quickly. Um, then you start. we started to really look at what was going on with the first party data that we had access to, which is all of the guests that shop Target stores. Well over a hundred million guests that we um, have information on. And um, we started to use it for ourselves, and then we started to see a significantly um, better performance when we started to work with first party data instead of all of the um, typical data that's available out in the marketplace. And in this case, it it's includes transactional data. It does. It's a big part of it, yeah. yeah it does. Including offline? Yes, I'm including offline. Because I think that's so interesting. Yes, you know, and, interesting. and especially offline. And yeah. that's that's if you want if you ask what the difference is between us and Amazon, we're the other ninety percent of retail sales that happen, um, which happens through our brick and mortar. And uh, really important differentiation because there's a whole lot of different behavior that goes along with that. So now you fast forward to data privacy laws, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, now marketers are starting to really lift the hood on the data that they've been transacting off of forever, and they're starting to realize that it's very flawed. Um, and I've sat in a couple of different client councils through the ANA as a member of Target's marketing team, and they're all like, oh my God, it's a cesspool in there. Um, and now that I'm looking, I'm really concerned, and why didn't anybody tell me? Yeah. And so we're really hitting this moment in the industry um, where data privacy is actually um, forcing us to ask the right questions as marketers on what kind of data we're actually transacting off of. And that's a really important piece. The other part is at the same time, especially for Roundell, what's happening for us is that we are, um, um, we are sticklers for brand safety mm -hmm. in the environment that our brand shows up in. And so we've parlayed that feature into the Roundell programs that we put out into the marketplace as well. So think of everything that has gone wrong with all of these different environments where a brand can pop up in. Um, we're especially careful to make sure that any brand that we're working with shows up in the right kind of environment too. So that was an important piece. And now the third part, and this is where the perfect storm starts to come together. So you've got data privacy, you've got brand safety issues, and now you've got accountability. And so if a retailer, as a media company, can start to show a Procter & Gamble, name any product that we sell through our stores or target.com, now we can show sales lift instead of a typical media relationship, which is about, I can show you media savings, we can now show top line growth. That's incredibly attractive to every CMO that is out there that it has to sh prove that marketing is an asset it's not a cost center. That's right. It's a revenue engine, right? Rather revenue engine, exactly. So um, I was at a, uh, an event last week and had a chance to spend some time with the CMO of Del Monte. It's a classic CPG, over 100 years old. And she said something really interesting. She's quite innovative. She said that they have collapsed the gap between traditional marketing and shopper marketing which I thought seemed really promising. So can you talk a little bit about h how you are working with organizations? Do you still run into a lot of the traditional shopper marketing folks and then overhear the marketing folks? Or? Less and less every day. Okay. And I'll tell you, um, you know, I've been in the, on the media side of the business uh -huh. for a long time um, from every angle of the media business too. And um, what's happening right now is that shopper marketing is the new black. Um, ah, and really? everybody okay. is kind of looking at that going, wow, here is a group of marketing people that have been held to driving sales for a very long time. How are they doing that? And we should bring that kind of exper expertise together with the kind of the, the brand marketing side of the house too, so that they can kind of cross-pollinate cross and really teach each other. So that um, development has been happening over the last couple of years. 
What, hap what happened most recently when we were at CES and we're meeting with a fair amount of client organizations too is now we're starting to hear that not only did they bring shopper and traditional marketing together, but now they're starting to organize around retail media networks. Um, so oh. instead of just having an Amazon person, Funny. you know, kind of watching how to market on Amazon, now they have groups really focused on really the three biggest of us, which is Amazon, Walmart, and Target. Well, and I will say it came up several times. You know, the Del Monte SEMA was just one example. I spoke to the head of integrated media at another CPG, uh, kind of backstage, and he said the same thing. He said, this is what I'm really got my eye on right now, the sort of retailers as media companies think. So clearly this is a phenomenon that's very attractive to them. You mentioned something about all of the seats that you've sat in over the years. Can you talk about what sensibilities you bring as a former agency person, as a former marketer to, to Roundell? Yeah, um, it, um, I've kind of looked at the business from all angles. Yeah. And I grew up on the creative agency side, always a media person, but on the creative agency mm -hmm. side. And so really learned early on in my career the value of brand and that brand, if you have a really strong brand, you can even impact the value of your stock by a significant amount. Um, and so, you know, really enjoyed the creative agency side of that, worked at Goodby Silverstein in, in, in particular during the dot-com, oh, yep. you know, the dot-com boom. So then had an inside look of all of the startups that were coming through Silicon Valley, um, have an opportunity to see what a great how a great idea can either grow or die, depending yeah. on who the management team is. Yes. So then you really start to look into human behavior and the impact of human behavior on a really great idea. Um, and it can either be a great asset or a great liability. So m maybe in that vein, this is a great idea that needs a lot of shaping and a lot of working. Uh, and you understand inside, again, the mind of the buyer and the marketer. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you bring that to those conversations? I do. You must. And, you know, I sat at Media Brands for a number right. of years, mm -hmm. having worked at a couple of the agencies there, and then was very engaged in Cadreon, which is their yep. um, trading capability. And so to understand even just what are the financial um, uh, structures to yeah. those kinds of businesses. And you know, if you're a holding company and you have to deliver a 20 some percent profit to, you know, to your shareholders, but then you've got clients saying, I'm only going to allow you to have a 10 percent profit. Totally. Like, where do you go? No, I mean, that's you know? exactly and, right. And that's where you start to um, really invest in these other businesses that can help buoy up your, your margin yeah. so you can have a proper return to your shareholders. Yeah. So as an industry, it was really easy for me to see, because of all those different angles, where we were breaking as an industry. Yeah. Um, and it just, it, the way that the structure of most of the financial agreements are set up are not fair to all parties that are involved. And there is a way to be fair and for you to still extract all the value you need to out of that relationship. We need like an hour to unpack that. We do. It's but we don't one. have time. <laughs> so let's shift gears slightly. Let's talk about TV. What are you guys doing? How are you innovating in the TV space? I'm super excited about this yeah. one because it is linear TV for a very long time has been trying to find different ways to break out and to really get out of this race to the bottom. Is my um, one of my favorite phrases is nobody wins the race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we're in this place where we can't be asking the networks to bring their costs down anymore. And um, so um, some of the partners that we're working with are really trying to find a different way to talk about a different value exchange or a different value proposition. And um, one, the thing in particular that we bring to the table is that we have a completely different way to build audiences, so you don't have to do demographics or gender. Um, you can do it based on shopping behaviors. And through those shopping behaviors, you know who they are as people. Like, what are they shopping for, diapers or? Um, luggage or whatever, um, it helps us understand who they are and what is going on in their life. Um, we can also start to apply that to what is that audience's favorite TV programs. Mm -hmm. okay. And so now think of, I don't have to do it based on attentiveness levels. I don't have to do it on premium programming. I can do it as this group of people likes these shows. Um, and so it actually changes the rancor. And um, the hypothesis that we've had with some of our partners is there is a lot of inventory that we are asking the media networks to give away for free because the marketplace isn't putting a value on them. Mm -hmm. Now we can actually show that there is a value to a lot of the inventory 
that is almost sitting in the long tail of the inventory that they have. Um, then on top of that, we can get to the place of, now we ran commercials against these audiences and look how your sales increased. Mm -hmm. So the value exchange becomes television can drive your top line growth, which we've had an indication of yeah. in our marketing mix modeling for a very long time, but now we can it's provable. And uh, it really changes the way that the networks can talk to advertisers. It changes the way that advertisers can prove to their CEO and their CFO that television, even though it's a huge investment, is growing, is driving top line growth. Um, so we're getting a lot of interest in the marketplace around that now. I have so many questions. I wish we I had know we only have 15 I minutes. Know. I know. I wish we had more time. I think I probably have time for one more question. Um, so in, in kind of in, the, in this vein of um, collaboration and connectivity and sort of more curated kinds of relationships rather than broad-based and open, are, is Roundell a walled garden? Are you the anti-walled garden? Like how do you think about how you play in this world when you have these assets? Yeah, and, um, we don't um, state it as anti-walled garden, but um, all of the same problems that Target as a marketer ran into, that I as a media professional ran into, um, were able in this new world order to just take a different approach to it. And um, we are very much focused on being a more open kind of environment. So no one company has everything. And if we don't start to admit that, we're never gonna move forward as, as an industry. And so we know that we play a very specific and unique role in the media ecosystem, and we're completely ready um, in signing up for that. That doesn't mean that you know our data is out there and available and free for everybody. Com the complete opposite to that. So if there's a, w a place that we're closed in, it's on protecting our guests in the in data privacy obviously very very important but that doesn't mean that there aren't ways that people can build um, completely anonymized audiences um, and really work off of um, audiences that we can build um, and so there is a way to do this that is accretive to the entire business and that's been our approaches if, if we approach the marketplace as open, we allow other partners to engage in that way, then I think we can kind of, we can bring a different solution to the marketplace that is the opposite of an anti wall uh, as, as of a walled garden. And the, one of the statements that I have is that media works best when it works in everyone's best interest. Totally, back to the sort of balance, right? The right. legs of the stool. Right, and so that's really the way that we're approaching the marketplace right now because if it's about one, one company winning, it obviously isn't to the consumer's best interest. Totally, I could not agree more. Um, there's business benefit to kind of worrying about the consumer and all of this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. totally.